I'm Dan Kane. I'm Wayne Heckler. I'm Joe Kane. And I'm Sal Conker. And this is the Imperfect Podcast. Or is it? Don't forget to check us out at hecklercane.com and download our episodes for free on SoundCloud and iTunes. To the bumper. <laughs> this week we're talking to writer and director Jared Cohn. Yeah, really creative guy. He came to us through October Coast Publicity, who we've worked with in the past, and his most recent uh, feature coming up is King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, which stood out as an indie film because it features things like CGI, which we really don't see that often because indies don't have the budgets. Yeah, this this actually had a decent budget on it, and it's got a lot of um, a lot of cool things that are happening in it. It's a, it's a really out there take on the King Arthur story. It's a exactly. good storyline, yeah. So yeah. The- and it features fight scenes, good choreography, uh, CGI, as we mentioned already, plus it's filmed in Thailand, which is pretty cool. Yeah. He's also got such a, a, a big, vast repertoire of things that he's involved in. He was involved in short, Sharknado. Um, as an yeah. actor. As an actor. Now he's writing a movie about Leonard Skinner and yeah. a yep. plane crash, and that'll be pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, he's writing and producing that movie on Leonard Skinner. Um, it's uh, he's been spent a ton of time with Artemis Pyle, which he talks about, and uh, you know I think there's just a lot to learn from him as a creative, uh, di- working director and somebody that's making a living out in L.A. For us, it was even more special because he's from Baldwin, Long Island. Yeah, right around the corner. Let's talk to Jared. No. Jared, welcome to the Imperfect Podcast. Thanks for joining us tonight. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for having me on. It's uh, you know, it's great to be here chilling with you guys uh, remotely, but nonetheless uh, together in spirit. Exactly. Yeah, I want to give a little quick shout out to uh, Clint over at October Coast for hooking us up. He's a great guy. Love Clint. Love Clint. <laughs> great guy. Huge shout out October Coast. They rock. Exactly. Yeah, hell of a PR firm, right? They're doing it right. Um, oh yeah. So we're out here on Long Island. You're out in LA, but turns out. You grew up down the block from us. Down the block, you know, good old Baldwin five one six. Nice. Wait, is, is Master Peak Is that five one six or six? It, yeah. it is also five one six. On the on the cusp, though, right? Yep, That's yep. on the border. It's next. Um, ne- next over is Amityville, and then you're in the six three one. Amityville, Lo- you know, <laughs> a lot of stuff. We we we, we won't talk about that. No, uh, but. A, you know, There's a good movie about that. So Amityville Horror. You know, <laughs> See, a, a few of them. A few of them. Exactly. Two or three. How long have you yeah, been out yeah. on the West Coast then? Uh, you know, about 14 years. Okay. Um, so it's been, uh, you know, go back, went back a couple times. Uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, out here just on the grind, on the grind. Yep. And so what brought you to L.A.? What was the journey like? Uh, you know, originally, uh, you know, I came out as an actor, uh, like many, uh, like many a folk and, uh, did a lot of work, you know, I did like 30 something movies, um, you know, from TV, some commercials and whatnot, but, you know, started writing and, and, and uh, slowly transitioned to, uh, behind the camera. Now I'm, now I'm a behind the camera guy. So it's been working out much better. So I think that was the universe's way of telling me to. Stop acting, you know. <laughs> in this business, you have to do it all, really. That's what it comes down to. You know, I, I will say this, that the uh, the acting definitely helped uh, the filmmaking. Um, so, you know, everything happens for a reason, like they say, and uh, it's good. You know, I, I definitely help. It's definitely helped. So I was going to say, how does being an actor affect the way you direct at this point? Yeah. Um, you know, communicating with the actors in a, in a way that they, uh, you know, understand better. A lot of like tech, there's a lot of like technical directors that don't really um, understand, you know, the acting side. So I think that's happened. You know, people, they, they refer to me sometimes as a, an actor's director, which is, uh, you know, what a, it's kind of a bland, generic term. But, uh, you know, it, it helps in that regard. But of course, you got to know your technical side of things. And, that's what I went to, the, to to school for because I was, you know, when I started off directing, uh, you know, I was good with the actors, but I didn't know anything about, uh, you know, cameras, lighting, and what the different departments did. So, you know, I wanted to learn all that stuff. What sure. what school did you go to? Uh, actually, I went to New York Institute of Technology. Okay. Oh, nice. On in Babylon, West Babylon. Yeah, good old so, NYIT. 
<laughs> FYIT, you know. Um, <laughs> shout shout out uh, to those to the, those guys. Yeah, we got a lot of Long Island constituents going on tonight. I love it. <laughs> Li, you know, <laughs> Li double R. <laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, what was your first gig directing then? Uh, you know, I did, uh, the first thing I did was a movie that I self-financed. Um, uh, I mean, the first couple of movies I did, I, I, I don't really consider them to be my first movie, but that, you know, that was technically, uh, you know, I took out my life savings and made this, uh, horror movie it came out actually all right, but you know, made no money, but it was good because, uh, the next film, whatever, whatever, you know, after that, but then, uh, I, had, I was writing all these scripts, and then, you know, I had acted in a bunch of movies for The Asylum. You know, I did Sharknado, and I did mm-hmm. Sharknado, and Z Nation, and um, and uh, I'd written a script, and I, because I, I knew the producers, um, they, were, they were like, oh, what do you want to do, direct, you know, or play the lead? And I originally wrote it for myself <laughs> to play the lead, but I was, at that point, I had directed a little bit, and I was like, you know what, let me, dir- you know, I want to direct this kind of shift gears, because the acting wasn't you know, wrong exactly how I'd planned, but, uh, glad I did that. Cause you know, that was a big movie for lifetime, you know, nice, good budget. And, uh, it's sort of, and then now I, I've directed 10 movies for the asylum. So, uh, um, you know, a bunch of stuff for lifetime, MTV, Showtime, you know, a lot of stuff on TV, some stuff in limited theatrical releases. So, you know, it's been good. Was, that, you know, huge shout out to the asylum. Love those guys. They kind of, I would say they, yeah. Sort of gave me a nice little, uh, you know, break in a in this uh, crazy industry. Yeah, that's cool. How did you initially hook up with them? I mean, they they gave you your first break on Sharknado. Is that uh, no? It was a- acting. I had uh, I had a- acted <laughs> in um, uh, four movies uh, gotcha. for them, um, and then that's how I kind of got to know the producers and was able to get a line on getting them uh, uh, my script, and they read it. Fine. I mean, it took you know, it took them a little bit to read it, but. I always will remember that phone call. I was actually in New York at the time in Long Beach, uh, and and the producer calls me. and He's like, "Read your script. I really like it." He's like, "What do you want to do with it?" I'm like, "Make it," you know. <laughs> and uh, so uh, I flew. I was on a plane then, like the next day, and 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 you know, it was on. It was great. It was, and that was like that was one of the best experiences of my life was shooting that movie, Born Bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is uh, actually, you know, here I got the poster up. I'm gonna, I'll pop it up. It's the only poster I have. I mean, I have other posters made, but oh, there it is. <laughs> nice. Very cool. Nice. Your first project. <laughs> yeah, it still, it still plays on, uh, on uh, Lifetime occasionally. But I got other movies. Another movie that premiered uh, in December, Evil Nanny. Uh, yes. So that and that one's coming out on DVD and VOD uh, in May or something. I got three movies coming out in May. So that's oh, cool. nice. Very You're cool. a busy dude. You know, I try to keep it, uh, try to stay active, you know, and what do they say? An object in motion stays in motion, so, uh, <laughs> boom. That's certainly true. So let's talk about King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. How did you get involved with that project? Because you, <clears throat> you, you know, did not write that, it, right? I did not write it. Uh, actually, the writer of Sharknado, Scotty Mullen, who was also the casting director at the Asylum, uh, wrote that, and we actually shot that movie in Thailand. It was produced by the Asylum. Uh, you know, we had a great production services company out there. And, you know, it's, and it's just a fun movie. That one's off the wall. You know, giant robot, uh, <laughs> you know, at the end. And they're gunfighting, sword fighting. So it's it's kind of a, you know, a wacky take on the King Arthur story. But it was fun. I think the people are going to really enjoy it. You know, if you don't take it too seriously, uh, you know, I think it's a fun movie. And it was fun. It was fun to shoot. You know, it was, it was a tight schedule, tight budget. But... You know, I'm I'm familiar with that world and uh, able to, it'll, able to pull that stuff off. Of course, if we had more days, more money, you know, it, it would be able to do more cooler things. But you know, I think we I think we did some cool stuff with what, what we had. I was going to ask you, how long did it take you to film that in Thailand? I think that was a uh, like 11 days or 12 days, something oh, crazy. That's pretty quick. Uh, quick. <laughs> that's like. The That's pl- lightning speed. The plane ride alone was almost longer than that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, for real, for real. Yeah. I mean, hyperspeed. You gotta, you gotta on, at that on that kind of schedule. It's just like you gotta be on Adderall or something, you know. Which I uh, might have had, no, you know, <laughs> off the record. I'll keep it ambitious. Um, yeah. how, but uh, how I long? Mean, ambiguous. Sorry. 
How, tell me about your experiences in Thailand. Was it an easy shoot? Was there some difficulty shooting there? Uh, you know, at this point, I've done three movies in Thailand. Um, and uh, that was the last... Uh, actually, no, that wasn't the last one. Uh, yeah, the last one I did was called Locked Up. Uh, and technically a sequel to Jailbait. Uh, but it was uh, it was good. I mean, you have the language barrier. and But most of the people, the key, the head department speak English. And then there's... A lot of people that speak English and they sort of relate to, you know, relate the information to uh, the crew. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it's fun. You know, I mean, the food, every time I go out there, my, you know, I wind up eating something that, you know, <laughs> fucks up my stomachs. <laughs> uh, so, sorry, am I allowed to cut? Yeah, 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 you're all good, yeah. Now, do you all have right, distribution good. there as well because you're filming? Yeah. Them? Oh, yeah, every asylum. That's the great thing about making movies for the asylum. I mean, they're just... They do their own distribution worldwide. They've been in business for like 18 years and, uh, you know, a killer company, great business model. Um, and, uh, yeah, I mean, it's all over. I was walking down the street in, in Thailand and I pulled out like four movies that I directed out of like a bin, you know, it was like a cardboard box with a bin <laughs> line of nice. movies. Very cool. Yeah. Might Very be cool. bootleg, but you know, probably. Right. still get your name out. Right. So, <laughs> you know exactly exactly whatever it takes you know get that uh get some shine time just well, out of curiosity uh filming like something like king arthur is that a, der a derivative work or is that considered uh, public domain at this point i think yeah i think it's public domain i mean uh, yeah definitely public domain you know uh i mean that was any classic fable or t story i think that's i mean who owns the rights i mean you yeah. have to say yeah. You know, the estate of King Arthur, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Well, the kids that were in the movie, right? That's <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's you know, right. someone should come forward and, and, like, have some trace connection and be like, and just try to sue all the studios and be like, I'm, I'm, I'm the great, 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 great grandson, you know, Arthur. There you go, right? Hey, now, in this film, you had really cool special effects. Like, who could you give a uh, tribute? Who did that? Who did the work on that? You know, the team at the asylum, they have an in-house, they have like 15 guys in-house doing uh, uh, visual effects as well as animation, and and uh, uh, it was led up at the time by Joe Lawson, and I mean, they've got so many different people, they've got one guy, you know, just does compositing, another guy is doing 3D modeling, another guy is doing the texture, so I mean, you know, it, it, it's it, it's a well-oiled machine in terms of the, the the visual effects department over there. So yeah, so they're yeah, a full up they're a full up production company, and they handle post it, and everything. And yeah, full yeah, full full in house studio. It's like a mini studio distribution. Everything goes in house. Uh, I mean, there are some VFX shots that they uh, uh, outsource, but uh, I think now it's pretty much. You know, all everything is in house. I mean, they have sound, you know, recording booth, colorist, yep, uh, everything. You know, turn key, full turnkey. Well, there's a lot that nice. stood out in this film. I mean, we get to be honest, we we get pitched a ton of stuff, yeah, um, all the time, and a lot of it. We get pitched a lot of horror because that's just that's what's out there. And this film yeah. definitely stood out to me because of well, one, it wasn't a horror, and two, um, there was because. Of, when we watch a lot of horror, it's a lot of practical effects. So in yeah. this, seeing the CGI and the special effects that came with it made it stand out. And the storyline was so different and unique, um, you know, being the, the storyline of King Arthur. Mm -hmm. How yeah. important were the CGI and the effects to the storyline and the direction of the movie? I mean, would the movie have held up otherwise? Uh, well, I mean, wouldn't have had the, the – I mean – the giant robot uh, would have been really tough to do uh, practically. I mean, I, I, I love, you know, we've done, we did some stuff practically in that uh, movie, but it was, yeah, it was definitely a VFX heavy um, show. I mean, there's a learning curve with uh, how to shoot uh, visual effects sequences. And, um, you know, we did some green screen stuff and, uh, you know, sort of how to compose the shots. I mean, uh, it, you know, it was a learning curve. My first, VF I learned a lot doing uh, Atlantic Rim, mm -hmm. which was sort of the mock mockbuster of uh, Pacific Rim. Uh, so, and then little doing, and then I did Little Dead Rotting Hood with you know the, the <laughs> giant the giant wolf. It's all on Netflix. It's on Netflix now. Check it out. Yeah. Um, little plug. Uh, so, sort of my you sort of 
you know, it, learn trial by fire. You know, you learn you learn how to shoot visual effects, and mm-hmm. um, you know, you get you, you you shoot something, then you know, the, you have to like stack it. You know, I mean, you have to unstack it. I'm sorry if you have your creature over here, and then you have your actor over here, and if they cross over, like it's a pain in the ass for the uh, you know, they have to rotoscope the guy out. So you know, I make you make that mistake, and then of course the VFX guys yell at you. <laughs> and right. and so you're giving us more work and do you get the uh, opportunity to have like a vx a vfx like supervisor on set supervisor. at any point yeah you know, i yeah i mean sometimes you know you don't have that luxury sometimes you do and then sometimes it's not necessarily a good thing because mm-hmm. uh you know they want to make their jobs easier and then of course you know uh they'll tell you to lock every shot off uh which is you know not that cool. It's nice to, you know, keep the camera moving. And, and if you do some handheld stuff, it, uh, uh, I mean, they can motion track sure. it. It just takes it's more work. much yeah. long, <laughs> much sure. longer. So, sure. so if you have the supervisor on set, he's going to be like, well, you should lock it <laughs> off. And, you know, and then, you know, so there's always that. But once, I think once you kind of learn and be able, the, the most important thing of shooting visual effects is, I think, you know, sort of being able to visualize it and explain it to the actors and the crew, and and uh, that was that was the time. And then, well, it just kind of clicked. You know, one day you're like, oh, duh, and it's simpler. You know, <laughs> sure. Well, with the bless fast, you, bless you. with the Fast and Furious schedule mm-hmm. that you had for shooting this film, does that just mean you got to double up on the prep work? What was pre-production like for this? You know, pre-production is so important. It is almost, in a way, more important than, than production um, because if you get all your pre-production on point, then production goes really smoothly. And, and if your pre-production isn't on point, your, your show will probably be a disaster. But, um, yeah, I mean, in term, there was the last... I remember on Knights, King, King Arthur. Oh, it was actually originally called Knights. Uh, uh, what was it? Uh, the final sequence, you know, was the, was the toughest to sort of map out and I, you know i did my prep on most prep on that now when i do movies uh if it's like a basic scene a couple of people talking or this and that I, I, i'm not doing shot lists or or storyboards i used to mm-hmm. and then you know you kind of do it and then you on set and and you you just throw them i mean i just throw, i don't do them anymore at this point because uh i, I like to, to you know design shots with with the actors and keep the camera moving and i mean you can't hold up a you can't hold up a piece of paper with a cartoon image and, and, and show that to the actor and say, I want you to do this. They're going to look at you like, <laughs> yeah, right. what, the, what the fuck are you talking about? You know, like, <laughs> what, what do you want me to do? Where do you want me to stand? Uh, so, sure. I mean, there's pe- you know, I think when you're doing like crazy action scenes with a lot of action and very specific shots that you need, then it's a good uh, time. You know, then it's important to story sort of uh, shot list. I, mean, I don't really store. I mean, I'll do some storyboards, maybe very basic stuff, but more importantly, shot lists, you know, yep. for the only those types of things. Right. Yeah, very cool. And there's a ton of fight scenes in this movie. Um, who yeah. chore- How did the choreography go for those? Who, who, who choreographed um, it? Was, I mean, we had a great stunt team, uh, local Thai guys, and we also had uh, one of the actors who plays Merlin, Harold Diamond. Uh, he was actually, uh, he played, uh, yeah, he played Merlin. He was also... In the original Rambo, he was the stick fighter, you know, that had that uh, stick fight. So he was there, and he helped choreograph some of the action and, and the stunt guys. And I was having everybody, chore- you know, practice at, all the time. When they weren't filming, I had them practicing because uh, otherwise it, you can't do it on the day. You can't you can't put together a cool fight, like, in two minutes. Then, you know, it, mm. someone's going to get hurt or, or it's going to look like shit. And... Uh, mm. So yeah, we 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 sp- definitely spent some time, uh, as much time as we could, uh, you know, on, on the schedule, yep. uh, you know, working out the fights. Yeah, and it was cool. A lot of uh, most of the actors were very physical actors in the film, obviously. So uh, yeah. you know that played into it, and in from a casting standpoint and everything. Um, what was the budget like for a film like this, if you don't mind? Yeah, you know, I think that was all in. That was probably like a quarter, you know, mm-hmm. quarter mil, something mm-hmm. like that. Um, but uh and what'd you guys yeah shoot, what'd you guys shoot on uh we shot that one on yeah red i think we are on two you know i think we had two red one oh, that, that might have been one red you know i think it was like a red scarlet uh hmm. that was sh- that we shot it on um by josh moss who did you know fantastic dp um 
and uh, yeah, you know, we used his lenses and um, yeah, and they're nice, nice. We had some toys out there, crane, dolly, and cool. uh, you know, I don't, I don't think we, re- I don't think we really did any handheld. On, a little bit, we might have done a little bit of handheld, but you get to like you know, an exotic that. location, and it's like, do you have to kind of discover what equipment is there, like? You're like, oh, we had a craned thing there, and we had this there. You're not like requesting it almost. It's like you just show up and go. Well, what can we use? Is is that yeah. what I'm getting from I, that? Or I mean, they had a, they have a. I mean, actually, I mean, they have a they have a lot of production. I mean, there's several. They shoot a lot in Thailand. Actually, a lot of Indian Bollywood movies shoot out there, and so mm-hmm. there's a lot of there's some good production services. Um, and it's it's a little bit different how they do it. Like every light comes with a crew guy like and that's their job is just to oh wow walk around you know move the light and you know it's different out here um but yeah i mean there, there's gear you know there's a lot of gear you can find out there you know we had a really nice jib and yeah you go through you know you they have a catalog kind of go through and you're like this is what we want to rent we want this crane we want these light, lighting package uh um you know they have camera packages and they actually that's the most expensive thing out there it's it's not the labor. It's not the crew rates. It's 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 the equipment rental. Uh, yeah, sure. You know, for some reason, it's it's. I mean, I, I, equipment anywhere is expensive. You know, if you're renting it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's that's always the great debate is you know investing in more gear or the you know how important is the gear versus the story and all that type of stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know, the story is way more important than, than mm-hmm. the gear. Um, you know, uh, technically, you know, you know, the movie should be you know. Has to be well. Has to be well shot. It has to be great audio. But that's sort of easy in compared to having a good script. Um, because yeah, I mean, you can have a hundred million dollar movie with a terrible script. It's going to be a terrible movie. But you can have you know a hundred thousand dollars with a great script and you know make a great movie. So it's it always it starts and ends with the story. You know, hundred hundred thousand percent. Of course, of course. So what's next for this movie? What does distribution look like? It's releasing uh, next month, right? Yeah, yeah, it's coming out. Was it the sixteenth or something? Uh, I think so. Yeah, something like that. Okay. Uh, yeah, worldwide, you know, uh, all platforms. It'll be on, you know, VOD, Amazon, iTunes. Uh, might it might roll on Netflix. Uh, you know, so it's a video title. Uh, it's a video title, so it'll be, you know, it'll get out there. Streaming definitely, VOD, I think. Streaming VOD. Streaming VOD. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, it'll it'll be. Uh, Probably transactional, probably TVOD. Uh, you know, usually, usually you hit uh, TVOD for a few months, and then, and then usually goes on a you know streaming service. Or it depends on the depends on the deal. You know, sure. some uh, you know some streaming services won't take it if it's if it's solely. I mean, no, wait, some uh, transactional. You prefer it's either one or the other. You want you kind of want to milk your transactional VOD before you yeah. go. And throw it on Netflix because it's you know you gotta mil- milk it, milk it for what, what it's worth, and then and then uh, kind of pass a buck. But it depends sure. on the title. Every every deal is different. Of course. Sure. So, is there anything that in particular you learned from shooting this film that you'll carry on to your next picture? Uh, for the, for that particular movie, you know, I think the biggest takeaway was. Uh, the choreography of, 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 of the, of the fight scenes. I, it, it, it occurred to me, you know, and then I put as much time and, and, and work in, you know, that we had. And then I realized that was like, not enough time. Like, hmm. you know, you got to go into it and I would, you know, put almost, you got to have the actor. And that's what I did. I'm locked up. The next movie I did in Thailand had a lot, had a lot of fights in it. So we actually had, we heard, I was very insistent that we had, you know, chore- choreographed the things before actually we shot. So uh, that that was the biggest takeaway, mm-hmm. and uh, just sort of pre production. And um, uh, yeah, I mean, a little bit more visual effects, you know, kind of learning and and interact interactive lighting. I I, I, I really like, you know, and especially it kind of complements the the visual effects. Um, but yeah, I mean, every movie, you know, you learn, you get more experience. So, you know, it's hard to kind of put your finger on it. But, you know, you grow, you know, as a filmmaker, you get more confident and, you know, you know how to kind of handle handle situations a little bit better. You know, when I first started directing, you know, I was, 
you know, not that I didn't, didn't know what I was doing, but it compared to now is, you know, much greener and, and, you know, you just get better as you go, you know, it's like anything else, you know? Yeah, sure, of course, of course. Well, Jared, I thanks so much for hanging with us tonight. We really appreciate you uh, joining us over here on Long Island. And, Long uh, Island, yeah. Thank, there... you, thank you guys. Thank you guys uh, for having me on. Of... Yeah, no, it's, it's great. Always good to meet fellow uh, Long Islanders. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, is there anywhere you can tell the folks at home where they can find you online, connect with you on social media, anywhere like that? Yeah, you know, I'm on, I'm on uh, all the, you know, the big three, Instagram, at Jared Cohn one uh, I'm on Twitter. Uh, you search my name, but it's like at Traplight Media, my production company. I'm on Facebook. Um, you know, Jared Cohn. So it's so all just you know, Google, Google search, and you know, my <laughs> my my, my shit will pop up. And yeah, if you want to follow me, that'd be great. You know, the more followers, the better. It's it's actually funny. They're hiring at you know, people get cast and directors get work be, just because you know your followers. They'll be you know right, because. Gosh. It's, you know, got to bring the audience with you, bring the audience with you. It doesn't matter if you're a good actor. If you have five million followers, (laughs) cast, you know, you get the role. Just like playing in bands. They want you to bring an audience with you a lot of the time. Right. It it makes sense, you know, to the venue. It makes sense for the distributors because, you know, you could be, you know, exactly. I mean, hey, this this actor has five million uh, followers and, you know, let's cast them. And then, you know, everyone, all their fans are going to, you know, see it and then. I mean, what what much more valuable than a you know a good a better even a better actor that has no you know no draw? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Of course, awesome. Well, Jared, thanks again so much. Yeah, one last thing. One one last thing. I'm do doing, it. I'm about to do it. I'm about to do a Leonard Skinner movie. I see all the guitars. Ooh. Uh, so oh, that's you. Excited. I got the I got the release for that. I didn't put the connection. That's you. That's me. Yeah, I've been working on this. I've been I've been consuming everything Leonard Skinner. I've been oh, hanging out with man. Artemis Pyle, one of the few survivors from the plane crash. The movies are mostly about the plane crash, but you know some events before, some after. But uh, yeah, I mean uh, we start shooting in, in ten days, and it's gonna be my biggest bu- biggest budget, biggest movie uh, that I, thus far, and it's been getting some good uh, PR. And yeah, so be on the lookout for that. It's called yeah. Street wow. Survivors. I'm the excited. Story. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, when you're that's uh, be fun, man. yeah, man. Yeah. When you when you wrap on that, we'll have you back on and and talk about it. Yeah, that's a yeah. good one. What's the name of it? Of course, names change all the time. But do you have a name for the film already? All right, it's called Street Survivors: The True Story of the Leonard Skinner Plane Crash. All right, very cool. Right. Very cool, man. Yeah, yeah. Man. so actually, it, there was a piece on Rolling Stone article about it. <laughs> uh, there was a uh, you know came out on Deadline, and there's been a bunch of. Uh, other stuff so i'm super excited about that you know i got the t-shirt on uh <laughs> and uh that's all i've been listening to leonard skinner leonard skinner leonard skinner and uh watched all the documentaries re- reading the books and and going tomorrow actually meeting up with a historian uh who's been studying leonard skinner and he actually gave me a good compliment read the script and he was like you pretty he's like you nailed this like, i don't know if i have much to add and i was like this guy's been, you know, <laughs> writing this book for four years, and he. So, I was very excited about that. That's like, awesome. Did you man. actually write the script for that as well, or no? I, I wrote the script. Oh, yeah, nice. I, I, All right. I spent I spent weeks, you know, with Artemis Pyle, uh, uh, the drum, you know, original mm-hmm. drummer yeah, from the sure. band, and uh, uh, you know, got the story out of him, filmed the interviews, and in addition, you know, watched all everything I could. Uh, it's still, I'm still doing the research uh, because there's so much out there. It's 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 uh, you know pretty pretty insane. I, and I, I was you know sort of a, knew the knew the hits before, but you know now now I know you know all it, the, all the tracks. So yeah, it's great. it gets a lot deeper, right? When you really delve in, sure. Yeah. A lot a lot deeper. Yeah, I mean once it, it, it's it's insane actually. I mean these guys lived a, a wild life, and there's you know there were seven of them in the band. Uh, so you know I mean it. it it was in the band members that kept coming, you know, different, there was different line lineups and, uh, and they're still actually going the brand Leonard Skinner, but I don't, I don't, I don't actually consider the band. It's not the same band. <laughs> no, it's not the same band. No. After, after October 20th, 1977, the Leonard Skinner band, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, you know, no longer existed. Right. And, and I mean, that, now they're playing shows with, 
one member from the original band, Gary Rossington. So mm-hmm. now let me ask you: Is Leonard Skinner music in the film? We do. Uh, we have licensed. Uh, Call right. me the breeze. Call me the breeze. Okay. okay. All right. Because that's important. You know, they made a Jimi Hendrix one, and they didn't have his music in it. So it doesn't uh, go yeah. as far. You know. Like it Ray Charles, it, Ray uses all the music, so it's like, oh, that's cool. So you need that as an edge. And we're work, we're working on getting some more track. We're working on getting like you know, Free Bird, Sweet Home Alabama in there. But you know, you're dealing with sure. uh, uni- Universal. You know, has has the masters in the publishing. So Jesus, you know, yeah. they're uh, yeah, it's tough. You know, there. it's it's a they want a lot, of course. Of I don't course. blame them. You know, sure. Yep. Yep. Well, that's awesome, Jared, man. That's Good luck really with cool. that. Yeah we're, yeah, we're musicians, so we get that. And we... <laughs> I know. I see. I see the guitars and the, all, all that. You guys, you guys are rock. You guys rock. Hell yeah, we do. <laughs> cool, man. Well, uh, really loved having you on. Can't wait to hear and see what you're doing next. And uh, hope everybody out there checks out King Arthur and Knights of the Round Table. <laughs> Oh, did I fuck up the word? Yeah. So what the hell do I do when you're done? I don't know. Just forget it.